I'm Mary Beth Hatfield with Tibbetts United Methodist Church. This video has been recorded for Sunday, November 15th, 2020. The link to the worship bulletin, including the song lyrics, can be found below this video. Let us center ourselves for worship with the song, Here I Am to Worship. Now, hear our call to worship. Come, share in the joy of the Lord. Delight in God's goodness. Praise God who gives each person a special gift to be nurtured and shared. Lord, we thank you for these gifts. Come, let us worship God who entrusts us with so much. Lord, Make us worthy of your love and trust in us. Amen. Hi, I'm Sawyer and this is my sister, Sydney. This is a book about our new vice president when she was a little kid. It's called Kamala and Maya's Big Idea by Mina Harris. What should be out there? Kamala asked her sister, Maya. Us, said Maya. A slide, said Kamala. And a swing, Maya added. A playground, they shouted together. Kamala and Maya had an idea. It was a very good idea. 
and a very big idea. They were going to need help. Wouldn't it be great if there was a playground in the court courtyard? Maya said. Turn that, one. that does sound nice, Mama agreed. How can we make that happen? Kamala asked. Well, I suppose the first step would be to ask the landlord, the person who owns the building. So Kamala wrote the letter and Maya drew the picture and Maya drew a picture. And they went to see the landlord to discuss their idea. The, the landlord thought about it for less than a second. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think so. No. That was not the answer they wanted, but they weren't ready to give up yet. That night, the sisters tried to think of ways to turn a no into a yes. They asked the other kids in the building if they wanted a playground in the courtyard. Did they? Of course they did. And they had ideas too. Let's have a teeter-totter and a basketball hoop and flowers. So Kamala wrote a longer letter and they went to see the landlord together. Dear landlord, right now the courtyard of our building is empty and no one uses it. If there were swings, kids could fly high. If there if there was a sand if there were was a sandbox kids could build if there was a slide kids could go so far so fast can you build it please the landlord thought about it for less than 5 seconds a project this big is expensive we don't have the money for that do your parents know you're here this was not the answer they wanted but kamala was not ready to give up if we ask our parents and do it all ourselves can we fix up the courtyard the landlord thought about that for a whole 10 seconds finally he shrugged if you can do it yourselves, sure. <laughs> this wasn't exactly the answer they wanted, but it was a start. The kids spoke to all their parents about their ideas for the courtyard. They hung up posters and knocked on neighborhood, neighborhood doors. But they got the same answer from everyone. I'm sorry. Wow, that's a big job. Wish I could help. Which they knew meant no, no, no. But then Mr. Green stopped to talk. I work construction and I could maybe get some scrap What's lumber that? and some sand for What's a that? sandbox really kamala kamala said yeah. yes exclaimed maya okay i'll try it wasn't a yes but right now maybe was the sweetest word they had ever heard maybe gave them hope the next weekend maybe turned into yes the kids all helped measure and Mr. Green cut the boards. Then they sanded and hammered and sanded some more. Then came the actual sand. They were all thinking Mr. Green when Miss Lopez stopped to talk. I work at a, a garage, maybe they Maybe they have an 
extra tire for a teeter totter. Teeter totter. Another maybe. In the weeks that followed, lots of I don't knows turned into maybes and then yeses. Kamala and Maya wanted everyone to celebrate the new playground, so they made another big poster inviting their neighborhood to a potluck party. There were hot dogs and hot dogs and hamburgers, spicy chicken and potato salad, strawberries and <clears throat> brownies and lemonade. Miss Flores set up a sprinkler for the kids to run through. Mr. Green brought the music. Kamala admired the new playground, but she noticed there was still one thing missing. No one knew how to make a slide, but Miss Flores knew where they might buy one. I teach at Emerson Elementary, and they are redoing their playground. Maybe we could buy the, the, their old slide. This was a different kind of maybe. A, how can we afford that maybe? But now everyone was trying to find a way to turn that maybe into a yes. These brownies are delicious. Maybe we could have a bake sale. We can all bring toys and books and have a sidewalk sale. Brownies. No one could do everything, but everyone could contribute something. I do see light. Yes, see. When the slide arrived at last, Maya and Kamala got the first ride. The landlord was impressed. I want to shake your hands, girls, he said. You did a good job. You all did a good job. Kamala and Maya had an idea. It was a very good idea and a very big idea. And with a lot of help, they made it happen. Hooray for Kamala and Maya! Hooray for the Persisters! What's next, Kamala? Kamala look at, looked this? up and said, I'm wondering what the view is like from the roof. <laughs> I hope you like Kamala and Maya's big idea. The gospel reading today is from Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. And then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. And in the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master! You handed over to me five talents, and see, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge 
of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents, and see, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have more will be given, and they will have abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Tibbetts United Methodist Church. It is good to be with you again. My name is Pastor Thomas Yang, and I'll be filling in for Pastor Sharon Moe, who uh, is filling in for Pastor Sarah Casey while she is away on maternity leave. I want to begin today by asking y'all a question. Are y'all tired of the pandemic? Are you tired of not being able to eat at your favorite restaurant or see your grandparents or grandchildren? In recent weeks, many countries, not just in the United States, but countries around the world are reporting an increase of pandemic fatigue or coronavirus burnout. People are feeling demotivated about following the recommended behaviors to protect themselves and others from this virus. And with no end to the pandemic in sight, many people are flocking to bars, family parties, and other indoor spaces with face coverings used sparingly. Yesterday in my hospice chaplaincy work, I spoke with a woman who expressed fears about having her brother travel from Portland to spend time with her family and their ailing father. She was frustrated because her brother-in-law's family goes out to eat at restaurants and they take trips to wine country. Meanwhile, she's working from home, trying to help her young children learn to do school at home. And all she could exclaim was, who is babysitting their kids? What I would give for a night out with my husband. It feels like we're the only ones who's taking this pandemic seriously. I felt her words deep in my bones. My wife and I have been taking the staying at home order and social distancing pretty strictly, and hopefully you have been too. And in a time where we aren't supposed to be seeing each other face to face, it sometimes, feel, uh, it sometimes feels like all the work that we're doing to protect those around us goes against the logic of the times, especially the logic of those who are feeling the pandemic fatigue, yet still were encouraged to press on. Making a choice different than those in your life brings us to today's gospel reading, the parable of the talents. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the gospels. And the parable of the talents is a well-known, simple story precisely because it's anything but simple. 
There are so many interpretations of this story, and as many churches begin preparing their annual stewardship campaigns, the parable of the talents lends itself well to encouraging people to be industrious and multiply the dollars that have been entrusted to them. A talent is said to be equivalent to 15 years worth of work. And if we consider the average salary worker in America, uh, that equates to just about uh, under $1 million. And from the perspective of the characters in this story, it's not unreasonable to say that these characters had literally won the lottery when their master hands over $5 million, $2 million, and $1 million with no instructions with what he had in mind. Statistically, 70% of people who win the lottery end up bankrupt in a few years. And I believe the lack of direction given by the master is what makes this parable so interesting. Over time, biblical commentaries began to look at this parable and fill in all the instructions that were blank with their own interpretations. Would you look at how entrepreneurial these first two servants were? Look how they were rewarded for doubling their investment and not wasting the opportunity that was given to them. And so when the master says, well done, good and trustworthy servant, you have been trustworthy in a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. It kind of seems like we are to imitate the actions and ambitions of the first two servants, doing the best with what they had, so that we too might be rewarded. But there is a problem with domesticating this parable into a moral lesson that says, always do your best. And the problem is, is that this spiritual lesson sounds like it came from a kindergarten soccer coach, not the radical Jesus who enters our world among the poor and despised, the most vulnerable, the most marginalized. What if this parable was to suggest that we should be like the third servant, the servant who received one talent and did nothing with the money given to them? What if instead of the usual interpretation, Jesus wanted us to identify with the one talent man? With most of Jesus' parables, the last object or person mentioned is the one that's usually held up as the model to follow. And if this is the case, I wonder what it could mean for us today. The people of the ancient Near East lived in a culture of scarcity and believed that the only way to get ahead was to compromise with the corruption of the ruling government. This is one reason why tax collectors in the Gospels are so despised. The ruling powers would use community members to extort and pay exorbitant interests on payments due. In previous sermons I've shared with you all at Tibbetts, I mentioned how this biblical world lived in a culture of scarcity. A culture of scarcity is one where one person gains social status or financial means, then it assumes that someone else must have lost some. If one family gains honor, then it assumes that another family must have lost it. And you can still find signs of a culture of scarcity in our world today, especially in Christianity. Many churches cultivate a scarcity mentality when they compare themselves to other, you know, so-called successful churches. If another local church's membership roster is growing, then some churches seem to think that theirs isn't because they're taking people away from them. I think that's a scarcity mentality we need to avoid. This parable does highlight a God who is a God of abundance. But let it not be about celebrating those who have much so that more might be given, or we might unintentionally value the cultural belief that only the wealthy are blessed in this life. Perhaps we have been so ingrained by the trappings of capitalism and consumerism that we automatically sympathize and even desire to be like the first and second servant. I know for myself, I struggle with the notions of what does it mean to be successful? What is an example of a life well lived? 
The spiritual lesson before us this morning is the inherent blessing that comes in living a life that is moral, righteous, and holy, even when those decisions come at our personal expense. Society would admire the work of the first two servants and their skill in making money off of others, but the third servant took a courageous, moral stand to do nothing in a culture where doing something would exploit and harm a fellow neighbor. The third servant speaks truth to power in calling out the master for reaping where he does not sow and recognizing, naming that the master was a harsh man. So the honorable route was to choose not to play the game and follow the logic of the world, to not take advantage of your neighbor, and to bury the possibility of enriching yourself at the expense of others. A few months ago, my wife decided to no longer shop using Amazon. It wasn't because Amazon is inherently evil or using Amazon services meant you're a bad person. It's because she decided that she was tired of participating in an economy that she knows takes advantage of people and ultimately enriching a master who already has billions of talents. I, on the other hand, wasn't so keen on embracing this choice so quickly. I enjoy the convenience of online shopping and two-day, sometimes same-day delivery services. I enjoy the competitive prices for goods that we regularly use. The list goes on. But the more I saw her stand in her conviction, the more it got me reflecting on my own values. Even though without Amazon, it takes us more time to go shopping for our necessities and uses more gas, and it isn't always the cheapest option, there's a deep peace that what we feel like we're doing isn't somehow contributing to the exploitation in a system that we know to be unjust. And this isn't to criticize Amazon, nor encourage all of you to stop using Amazon, because Amazon is just functioning how our culture and society operates. This parable is not about building the kingdom we long for, but the kingdoms we've already created and how it actively shapes our lives. As Christians, Jesus is challenging us to make decisions based on our values of doing no harm and to do good while staying in love with God. And sometimes, those decisions will come at our own personal expense. The pandemic, especially when it first began, truly exposed how frail and fragmented our social support systems were for our neighbors. When restaurants, businesses, schools, churches began shutting down. It was almost as if a light switch turned on. And as a society, we saw plainly how many were in need of emergency food assistance, applying for unemployment benefits, even lacking reliable and steady internet connections. What started as a public health crisis quickly spilled over to human services. In my neighborhood of South Park, not too far from West Seattle, where you all are located, a grassroots movement of neighbors organized themselves to create community stations where neighbors can leave food ingredients and supplies for their neighbors. There's a sign at each station that says, take what you need, leave what you can. At our local Concord Elementary School, the PTA started a fundraiser that, to date, has raised over $75,000 from individual donors, not from grants, to make sure families who need help with bills, and especially for rent payments, can meet their deadlines. What an amazing testament to a God of abundance in these difficult times. In a society of scarcity that encourages us to stockpile toilet paper for our households, there is a holy logic of abundance that says no not at the expense of my neighbor, not until my neighbors are cared for. Friends, the good news is that God created a life of abundance for us to participate in so that we might carry out God's purposes in the world. When we as a society 
recognize the harmful ways our culture subtly teaches us to look out for only our own interests. We miss out on God's dream for our neighbor. It is a blessing to center the most marginalized in our society. And my hope is that God might convince you to make changes in your own life so that others might experience liberation. May it be so.
Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the, the glory, glory, now and forever. Amen. My name is Betsy Wharton, and I have a few announcements today before the benediction. First, we welcome Reverend Thomas Yang to be with us in worship for the next two Sundays. Many of you have met Reverend Yang when he's preached at Tibbetts, and we're glad he's able to step in. And our prayers continue for Reverend Sharon Mo. She recently had a fall and is unable to continue planning worship services or preaching while she focuses on recovery. She's continuing with us in providing pastoral care until Pastor Sarah returns to Tibbetts on November 29th at the start of Advent. We are blessed Sharon was able to be with us these past months and hold her in prayer for a full recovery. From the outreach team, it's a different year for Mary's Place Giving Tree. They will still be providing important Christmas cheer and there are a variety of ways to donate and support the cause. Please go to their website, marysplaceseattle.org to see how you can help. We're looking for people who knit or crochet or wish they knew how. We're making warm hats for the homeless, and as the weather is turning colder, hats become more and more important all the time. The hats will be distributed at the welcome table, and if you need encouragement, yarn, patterns, or pickup of completed hats, please contact Shirley Lindbergh or the church office. And the last update from the outreach team, Transgender Day of Remembrance is being held on November 20th at 7 p.m. Please see the weekly announcements email for a link to register and join the service. The names of the transgender people whose lives were lost in acts of violence last year will be read during the service as a part of the remembrance and support. From the relationship team, we're having Zoom sessions to keep us connected. Sundays at 11 a.m. or Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have fellowship time. And the Gen Intergenerational Book Club is starting up again on Sunday, the 22nd of November from 3 until 4.30 p.m. There are a number of reasons to visit the church website, tibbetsumchurch.org. The worship tab on the far left side is where you can see all of the worship videos, past and present. On the news and events tab, there are links to Zoom sessions we're holding. In addition to the links for the relationship Zoom activities, Wednesday mornings we have Bible study at 10 a.m. On the subscribe tab, you can see how to receive our weekly announcements emails, which are sent out on Thursdays. It's a great way to stay in touch with your Tibbetts family and the news of the church. If you have a prayer request, please email the church office and we'll be glad to include you in the prayer chain. Have a wonderful day and a blessed week ahead. Bye.
God's love transform you, may Christ's light shine through you, and may the Spirit guide you this week. Go in peace, friends. Mm-hmm.